right, good afternoon. Welcome, welcome to everybody um, <clears throat> here in the room and to those of uh, you who are joining us via the webcast. My name is Jeffrey Kahn. I'm a professor of bioethics and public policy at Johns Hopkins University, and I had the privilege of chairing uh, the Committee on the Ethical and Social Policy Considerations of Novel Techniques for Prevention of, mito of Maternal Transmission of Mitochondrial DNA Diseases. A mouthful still. We're uh, really pleased to be here today at a public um, discussion event. Um, so the, the sort of order of things here, just to give folks a, a sense of what we're going to do is, is first, once I um, finish my, my welcome and a little overview remarks, I'm gonna turn it over to Celia Witten from the FDA, uh, after which the committee will do a short presentation about our recommendations and then we will open it for um, questions here in the room and, and via the webcast. So we will devote a fair amount of time uh, to discussion, which is, of course, the, the purpose of our being here. So I think without any further ado, I will um, welcome and, and thank Celia Witten, who is the uh, director of the Office of Cellular Tissue and Gene Therapies within the Center for uh, Biologics Evaluation and Research of the FDA. Uh, thank you for that introduction and for coming here today. Um, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to present the uh, same presentation just with a little bit more that I provided to this committee at the outset of the uh, study project uh, that in the meeting where we set the charge for the committee. But before I do that, I just would like to publicly thank both the committee and the IOM staff for what really was a wonderful job to uh, resulting in a report in an area which must have been very complex and challenging for both the IOM staff and also for the committee. So thank you. Hmm. Ah, so just as I said uh, months ago or a year ago when this project started, so to set the stage for this, the problem is the following. There's a woman with a mitochondrial disorder based on mitochondrial disease that transmits the disease to her first child. She wishes to have a second genetically related child but without transmitting the disease. What are her options? Um, and I'm not gonna go over this in detail. As probably many of you know, the mitochondria are energy producing organelles, subcellular organelles, and they have a number of other functions as well. Mitochondria contain their own genome, and mito these are inherited maternally. There's a high mutation rate and a number of known diseases from mitochondrial mutations. So there are, what brought up the whole, uh, oh, the interest in this from our end um, was uh, the growing scientific literature looking at two approaches to help solve the clinical problem that I presented, which is avoiding maternal transmission of diseased mitochondria. One is so-called maternal spindle transfer and then pronuclear transfer. I'm not going to go into these in detail, except that the maternal spindle transfer involves a donor oocyte with the spindle removed and replaced with the spindle from the mother and then subsequent fertilization to reconstitute an embryo. And pronuclear transfer is similar, except that the pronuclei of the zygote are removed and replaced with the pronuclei from the parents and the embryo reconstituted in that manner. So knowing that the questions were uh, coming regarding uh, what would be needed in order to support an investigational study in this area, our office held an advisory committee meeting in February 2014, and I have the topic listed, Mitochondrial Manipulation Technology and Assisted Reproduction for Prevention of Transmission of Mitochondrial Disease or Treatment of Infertility. That meeting, uh, the stated purpose of that meeting was to discuss potential future clinical trials of mitochondrial manipulation technologies it was not intended to focus on a specific technology. No specific clinical trial was discussed. 
and it wasn't intended to support a specific regulatory action. So in other words, it wasn't because we had a specific file that we were taking action on. It was to prepare ourselves with the background of a scientific discussion regarding what we should consider in an application of this nature. Specific topics discussed at the advisory committee in 2014 included ability of animal models or other methods to address safety issues, risks to mothers and children, clinical trial design elements, and manufacturing and processing controls for safety. Not discussed, so at the meeting, scientific issues were discussed, and that was what the meeting focused on. Not discussed at the meeting were ethical and social policy issues uh, raised by heritable genetic modification. We received a number of comments from the public at that meeting, and not only because of those, but just because we also realized that these were important concerns for the public, determined that we would ask the Institute of Medicine to do a con the consensus study that is the subject of today's discussion. The next couple of slides are from this verbatim from the charge to the committee. They're excerpted from the charge to the committee. So ethical and social policy issues, these were examples of issues that we asked the committee to address, but we didn't restrict them only from addressing these specific issues. So one is whether manipulation of mitochondrial content should be considered germline modification from a social and ethical perspective, the implications of manipulating this content uh, both in children born to women as a result of participating in these studies and in descendants of female children, ethical issues in providing consent for risks on behalf of a child who doesn't exist, and ethical and social issues for a child born with genetic material from three individuals. One of the questions we asked the uh, Institute of Medicine to consider was the foundational question of whether safeguards such as specific measures and public oversight could adequately address social, these social and ethical concerns or whether the concerns precluded clinical trials. And then we asked for specifics on some specific issues that we wanted them to address if a trial were to go forward, such as informed consent, enrollment, and tracking, uh, how we should take into account alternative approaches or factor this into our assessment of a trial, and whether we should or what we should consider in terms of what the implications would be for trials that might go beyond uh, the specifics under consideration, which is prevention of transmission of mitochondrial disease. So one of the questions that came up that we discussed at the Institute of Medicine kickoff meeting, so to speak, is how we were going to use the information. And one of the things that I explained at the time was that when we receive an application for a clinical study, we have 30 days and either to let the IND be in effect or to put it on hold. That review is confidential. And certainly for reviews of applications in this area, we'd want scientific and ethical advice so that we were preparing ourselves for review of these types of applications, both by having our advisory committee to discuss the scientific issues and the Institute of Medicine consensus report to consider the social and ethical issues also in our application review. So that's where we left off during the meeting in which I introduced the charge to the committee. Uh, subsequently, though, I want to mention that in December 2015, Congress passed and the President signed into law the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2016, known as Public Law Number 114-113 which for fiscal year 2016 prevents the FDA from using funds to review applications in which a human embryo is intentionally created or modified to include a heritable genetic modification. As a result, the agency will not accept or review INDs related to genetic modification for the prevention of transmission of mitochondrial disease in the fiscal year 2016. I have the language from the law verbatim on this slide so that people can read it for themselves. One comment I want to make, and it just relates to the language in the law, it's the question of what it means to not receive an application. What it means is the IND will not be accepted for review by the agency, and because FDA will not accept the FDA application, 
human subject research utilizing genetic modification of embryos for the prevention of transmission of mitochondrial disease cannot be conducted in compliance with the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act or the Public Health Service Act and FDA's implementing regulations. So that it concludes my talk. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Dr. Khan for the committee's presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Witten. So uh, the, the plan for our presentation is to do a sort of brief overview of our um, report and its recommendations, and, and we'll present um, sort of in a, in a serial fashion here. Um, first thing I need to, to note is for those of, of uh, you who are participating via the webcast and would like to submit questions, please do so by um, sending your questions to the email uh, address on the slide and we will make sure to read them out during the uh, question and answer period. That's a, a nice shot of what is now a, a finished report uh, available on the, um, the website for uh, download. The other thing to add since the release of the report is that there is now an interactive and, and print infographic that can be obtained at the nas.edu uh, URL that you see on the slide. It has uh, further information about um, uh, MRT, the techniques, uh, some of the definitions that we use, and so forth. So a uh, uh, hopefully helpful uh, resource for those who are, are interested, available as you see here. So the rest of the overview will consist of the following. We'll give a, a brief study context, the results of our ethical analysis, and our recommendations. There again is the email address for your questions via the webcast. So as, as you heard a bit in Dr. Witten's um, remarks, um, mitochondrial replacement techniques could prevent, potentially prevent transmission of mtDNA diseases from women to their offspring. But the techniques raise not only safety issues, but so social, ethical, and policy concerns as well. Um, some countries have considered whether to permit going forward with MRT and how to regulate them, with the UK being farthest along. In 2014, as you heard, the FDA held advisory committee, an advisory committee meeting to discuss the state of the science, but was not charged with addressing the ethical, social, or policy considerations. And so um, the FDA requested of the IOM that the, the committee that those of us sitting up here and a few others who are not here today uh, were asked to participate in uh, to evaluate the issues that Celia outlined in her slides. The committee had a diverse expertise, a uh, range of perspectives, and we think was quite balanced. The report went through the typical peer review process that the academies uses, which is quite um, uh, involved and, and uh, there's a response required from all of the reviews that come in, and, and so the result of that process is the report that is now available. The committee was charged, as, as you heard Celia articulate, um, with considering ethical, social, and policy issues raised by these techniques, and to assess whether it would be ethically permissible for clinical investigations of MRT to proceed, and if so, uh, to articulate the circumstances and conditions under which such clinical investigations might be ethically conducted. The members of the committee, as RUC here, I'm not going to mention all of the folks. I will just say that everybody on this list is here save three. Uh, that's Jeff Botkin, Bamsi Mutha, and Keith Walu. So you, you see before you almost the in, entire committee. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Marnie Falk for the next part of the presentation. Great, thank you, and thank you to everybody here for coming. So a very brief overview, Dr. Witten did a wonderful job, just to provide a few more details on mitochondrial biology and genetics that brought us all together. Mitochondria are indeed subcellular cytoplasmic organelles. They're uh, critical for energy production within cells, although they do have uh, quite a few other physiologic roles, such as calcium regulation, program cell death, and many roles in metabolism. The mitochondria do indeed contain their own mitochondrial DNA. It's the only source of DNA outside of the nucleus. 
yet there are only 37 <coughs> genes within that mitochondrial DNA, and there are more than one copy per mitochondrion. As a matter of fact, there could be tens to hundreds per cell, and in the oocyte, there's up to 100,000 copies um, um, per oocyte. While eggs and sperm both have mitochondrial DNA, they're passed on to offspring only through the maternal lineage or only through oocytes. Uh, one of the uh, unique features of mitochondrial DNA is that a cell, a tissue, or an entire individual can have a mix of mitochondrial genomes where some are normal and some contain a mutation. That state is called heteroplasmy, and that's unique and different from what would happen with nuclear DNA. When the mitochondrial DNA has an error, whether it's a typo or a point mutation or a large chunk of mitochondrial DNA missing, uh, the results can be um, uh, dysfunction of nearly any organ in the body. Um, this slide provides a schematic to remind us that it could affect the brain um, and the nervous system, both the brain and the spinal cord, the vision, the hearing, the muscles, the kidney, uh, the liver, um, really uh, fatigue and exercise intolerance, uh, really any feature at any time can be seen. When we consider who would use MRT, it's important to realize that this is not about treating a person who is already living with mtDNA disease. Rather, it's about preventing the transmission of mtDNA disease when we know there is a risk. There is a parental desire uh, for offspring to share a DNA connection with both parents that is widely held but not universal. Not all goals of prospective parents with um, the risk of transmitting mtDNA diseases are met by current alternatives. These include um, unassisted sexual reproduction, using in vitro fertilization with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis of the embryos they do make, oocyte or embryo donation, adoption, or childlessness. Uh, the committee um, concluded that the desire to access MRT can justify proceeding with clinical trials subject to limits that focus on protecting the health and the well-being of the uh, future children born after the procedure. To spend a little bit of uh, time just reviewing the two uh, procedures in more detail, um, as Dr. Witten mentioned, there's MRT um, that Im involves maternal spindle transfer and uh, also MRT that involves pronuclear transfer. Those are the two major categories that um, are discussed. Um, in MRT that involves maternal spindle transfer. Um, it involves oocytes um, where the manipulation occurs, the oocyte or the egg. There is an oocyte from a provider or a donor and an oocyte from the intended mother. In both cases, there is a chromosome spindle or, or really in the nucleus of the cell where the majority of the DNA um, in the cell resides. Um, and in the donor's oocyte, the spindle is removed and discarded, and only the remainder of the cell containing the healthy mitochondria remains. In that um, karyoplast um, or remaining cell, the nucleus or spindle from the intended mother um, is fused. Uh, that reconstructed oocyte is then fertilized um, um, to produce um, an embryo. In contrast, pronuclear transfer, again, is quite similar except in both cases, the oocyte's oocyte, sorry, the donor's oocyte and the intended mother's oocyte are both fertilized. They go to the first cell stage where uh, both the nuclear content from the egg and the sperm reside. Um, um, that is called uh, the zygote. Um, and that, that nuclear content called the pronucleus is discarded from the donor um, while the, um, the, it is uh, maintained from the intended mother. Um, that is then reconstructed um, and allowed to grow um, into um, a zygote and then an embryo. Um, MRT and gene editing are quite distinct. It's important to recognize in both techniques that we mentioned that MRT involves replacement of whole, intact, naturally occurring mitochondria that contain mitochondrial DNA. There is no targeted genome editing of any portion of the content of the DNA in that mitochondria. MRT replaces, again, the empty DNA by replacing the entire organelle. In contrast, a gene editing technology, such as CRISPR-Cas9 or other techniques, edits genes that reside within the DNA, be it within the nucleus or within the mitochondrial DNA. Another difference is that MRT applies only to the manipulation of germ cells, oocytes or zygotes. In contrast, 
CRISPR-Cas9 could be employed in either germ cells or in somatic cells. This re, uh, continues the discussion that you just heard, uh, reminding us that MRT does involve the replacement of whole, intact, and naturally occurring mitochondrial genome. And when we're thinking about uh, the core genetic relatedness and the public understanding, the traits that are carried in the nuclear DNA uh, related to uh, physical and behavioral characteristics and forms of disease seem to be the ones that stand out. Now, it might be theoretically possible for MRT to uh, be used for uh, energetic enhancement to improve the function of mtDNA uh, with regard to increasing cell energy. Hypothetically possible, but this appears to be far more speculative uh, than discussions of modification of nuclear DNA. In drawing these distinctions uh, between mtDNA and nuclear DNA, uh, it's important that to emphasize that this does not imply that mtDNA is unimportant, uh, but rather that its modification uh, is meaningfully different from that of nuclear DNA. Now, uh, MRT uh, results in the genetic modification of germ cells, uh, but MRT uh, producing or leading to female offspring uh, and that would constitute a heritable genetic modification or germline modification. But if the MRT is producing male offspring, this would not constitute heritable genetic modification because the modifications would not be passed down. Now, several concerns are cited about genetic modification of germ cells. Uh, safety. Uh, the FDA would look at preclinical data related to safety uh, in considering a protocol if it came before it. Uh, another concern relates to interference with nature uh, and playing God. Uh, interference with nature uh, often focuses on uh, crossing a line that has been drawn as uh, inappropriate or arrogant interference uh, with nature, and that's sometimes expressed uh, in kind of freestanding language of playing God as a kind of slogan uh, to offer as a critique of certain modes of genetic uh, intervention. But as a freestanding notion, uh, this is vague and indeterminate. And if we look at particular religious traditions, we see a great deal of variety in the responses of those traditions to various uh, genetic modifications. Concerns arise about eugenics uh, and attitudes toward disability, and the report emphasizes uh, the avoidance of coercive eugenics. It also emphasizes that uh, individuals uh, seeking to have children using MRT are aiming at having healthy children uh, and are not uh, intending uh, discriminatory attitudes uh, toward those who, are, who have disabilities and that an important way the society needs to address those uh, negative attitudes uh, related to disabilities. Those are, there are a variety of ways to do that uh, without necessarily prohibiting uh, MRT. And then, of course, concerns about uh, crossing uh, the germ line. Uh, these concerns about uh, human genetic modification or germ line modification do warrant, in the committee's judgment, significant caution and also uh, important restrictions, but not a blanket prohibition on MRT uh, to, present, to prevent the transmission of serious uh, mtDNA disease. Questions also arise about possible extended applications. Um, the, a couple of things uh, work together to uh, circumscribe applications and set natural limits on the potential for misuse, and those are the differences between mtDNA and nDNA we've just discussed, but also the nature of the replacement techniques uh, that uh, we discussed earlier uh, in the uh, slides. Still, even with those uh, natural limits, uh, regulations and guidelines are needed to limit uh, the use of MRT to the prevention of transmission of serious, life-threatening mtDNA diseases uh, as well as to prevent slippage uh, into applications that raise other serious uh, and unresolved uh, 
ethical issues in the society. A genetic contributions from two women of different maternal lineage uh, obviously would introduce complexities that could affect a child's experience of identity, of kinship, uh, and ancestry. And this is an important matter uh, for families to reflect on uh, in considering whether to undertake MRT. And it's also an important matter for societal discussions. But in the committee's judgment, these complexities alone are not sufficient to justify prohibiting the initiation of MRT uh, clinical investigations. Other considerations uh, that are important from an ethical standpoint uh, have to do with manipulation of embryos, uh, and the report points to other useful ethical frameworks that exist that could inform uh, discussions of the appropriate boundaries of embryo manipulation in MRT investigations. Another ethical uh, consideration has to do with equitable access uh, because there is a potential for differential access by individuals of, of, of different uh, socioeconomic status. Uh, but that potential for differential access did not seem to the committee to be a sufficient reason to abandon MRT development, but rather instead to direct attention to the challenge of reaching individuals who might benefit whatever their uh, socioeconomic uh, status. So to um, address some of these in uh, some specific fashion, the committee recommended a variety of conditions that should be uh, placed upon clinical trial initiation and also some overarching principles. Uh, with regard to the conditions, uh, first and foremost, of course, was the uh, notion that efficacy and safety needs to be reasonably established through preclinical work before anybody commences. And this, of course, is consistent with FDA practice. Um, it also, the committee also recommends that the uh, clinical trials, if they were to go forward, be limited to uh, people who've got serious mtDNA diseases so that we're looking at uh, maximizing the uh, benefit to risk ratio. And um, finally, uh, as has already been referred to by uh, Professor Childress, uh, the committee has suggested that we avoid for the moment making heritable modifications, and to that we recommend that there only be male embryos used because as you saw from uh, Dr. Falk's presentation, the mitochondria are passed down through the egg, not through the sperm, so any male child who was conceived using this technique who then proceeded to father a child would not be passing along those uh, amended mitochondria, but instead would, uh, that change would stop at that first generation. Um, we did not conclude that one could never proceed to female embryos, um, but we placed some uh, conditions on what would be an appropriate trigger for that, which I believe that uh, uh, Dr. Khan will be talking about in a moment. Uh, in addition, uh, we also noted that it's important to remember that since we're dealing with women who have mitochondrial DNA disease, that they themselves need to be healthy enough to carry the pregnancy to term without serious adverse consequences for themselves. Uh, the technique is not one that can be done by anybody uh, with uh, the same degree of success being possible, and so we recommended that the investigations be limited to investigators and to centers that have uh, the requisite kind of expertise. And in addition, because the research here was um, not as completely clear about uh, nuclear DNA and empty DNA interactions, we suggested that the FDA review the rationale and plan for so-called MTA DNA haplogroup matching uh, and to see whether or not it was compelling enough that that should become something that was important in the construction of these trials and in the selection of the donor eggs. Um, we also said that there are some overall principles that are consistent with these conditions. Uh, the first is that really the children's interests be given priority when constructing the trials and when looking at how to maximize benefits and minimize risks. The second was to make the trials as useful as possible by uh, incorporating standardized designs where possible so that data could be compared from trial to trial and to uh, encourage the use of data from research going on outside the United States and data sharing in general so that information can be accumulated from as many sources as possible in a way that is usable. 
And very importantly, as a matter of principle, we suggested that long-term follow-up was an essential aspect of this particular kind of uh, research, and that we should be looking both at the physical well-being, but also the psychological well-being of any children who were conceived using this technique, and that would include their own perceptions about things like their personal identity and their kinship uh, status. Last, um, uh, a word about preclinical research. To the extent that preclinical research might involve work on human embryos in addition to what we might think of as the more traditional work in vitro and uh, animal, uh, we laid down some principles for work with human embryos. And the first was that we should make sure that the embryos have an ethical provenance. That means that they were obtained with appropriate informed consent from the donors. Uh, that wherever possible, non-viable embryos be used, and if viable embryos must be used, that they be used in the smallest number and at the earliest stages of development that would be consistent with achieving the kind of scientific outcome that you need in order to uh, learn enough from them to help make this procedure safer and more effective if it were to move into human clinical trials and even uh, further down the road into uh, human clinical practice. At this point, I think I will turn it back over to Dr. Khan. Thank you. <clears throat> so you, you heard from both um, Professors Childress and, and Sharo that the committee um, concluded that uh, moving forward in human clinical investigations of MRT could be done on, in an ethically um, permissible way that there needed to be principles and conditions in place and that the uh, initial investigations need to be restricted to male embryos. We also said that the FDA could consider extending that clinical research to include the transfer of female embryos if three conditions were met. First, that there would be clear evidence of safety and efficacy from male cohorts using identical um, procedures uh, of MRT that that uh, evidence was available, that second, there was sufficient preclinical animal research showing evidence of intergenerational safety and efficacy, so that is the concern about um, passing on the genetic change that MRT would introduce in female offspring. And then the third condition, that the decision to move forward needed, needs to be consistent with the outcomes of other deliberations which are ongoing, um, being led at the moment by the National Academies to establish a shared framework concerning heritable genetic alterations, such as the use of gene editing tools like those you heard about earlier. We also spent some time talking about uh, the process of the clinical research and noted that there needs to be special attention to communicating the novel aspects of MRT research to the potential participants in that research including the groups that you see listed here, gamete providers, the intended parents, and children conceived as a result of MRT. We identified a number of principles that are, uh, we thought, important and necessary for um, the oversight of such research, and they include transparency, which would include the timely public sharing of information and the encouragement of sponsors to commit to depositing protocols and the uh, uh, de-identified results in publicly accessible databases. Second, uh, public engagement to explore stakeholder views, including public meetings, such as this one today. Partnership, so collaboration with other regulatory authorities, both within the United States and around the world. And, and maximizing data quality to enable cross-referencing and pooling of data, and you heard to talk about that. In addition, that there be a principle by which the, the use of these technologies could be carefully circumscribed, and we, we thought that that uh, needed to include the FDA using whatever means it has at its disposal to limit the use of these techniques to the indications, individuals, and settings for which it receives approval, if it does receive such approval. And if there is consideration of uh, broadening the use of MRT, that, uh, that there needs to be uh, an engagement in a, a fresh analysis, including the, the public's input regarding that proposed decision. And then the last principle is for around long-term follow-up, uh, whereby 
uh, sponsors would be required to design, fund, and commit to long-term monitoring of the offspring born via MRT. So just to reiterate a few of the um, resources, so the report itself is available at the URL at the top of this slide. Uh, email for your questions at this time should be sent to the email address on the screen. And then I guess we still have a Twitter handle for at least the, the next few um, minutes, if not hour, until the committee is um, officially finished with its work. Um, with that, we, we up here and our, our colleagues who are not here with us today need to say thank you to the uh, very able uh, and very dedicated, hardworking, above and beyond IOM staff who uh, led us through this process. That includes Ann Claiborne, who was study director, Rebecca English, who is program officer, Morgan Bonaim, who is associate program officer, Mike Berrios, who I think is away in London today, senior program assistant, and then Andy Pope, who is the director of the Board on Health Sciences Policy of the IOM. With that, I think we say um, we're open for questions. Uh, please, if you're in the room, come to the microphone and um, tell us who you are, ask your questions. We will also have questions coming in via the webcast, and I know that we also have some questions that were submitted in advance, which we can uh, intersperse those live and via the webcast. 